Look, this is an expository talk on monstrous moonshine. It's based on some old slides I found from a talk in about 1998. So it's definitely a historical talk rather than one based on current research. So first we'll just quickly describe what the monster simple group is. So the monster simple group is the largest of the sporadic simple groups, which has this ridiculously large order. Here it's given in factorized form as a product of primes. If you want to write it out explicitly, it's this rather impressive number here. Um, this number is rather more than number of elementary particles making up the earth, for example. So give you some idea of its size. Um, it lives as a group of symmetries in various dimensions. Um, in particular, mm -hmm. the smallest dimension in which you can represent it as a group of symmetries is this number 196883. The next dimension is 2129876. Um, so on the other hand, um, there's something called the elliptic modular function in complex function theory, which is this used to be a rather obscure function that most people hadn't really heard of. And it has a power series expansion. Um, so the first coefficient is 744, the next is 196884 and so on. And one day John Mackay had been, he used to work in finite group theory and decided he would move on to Galois theory where the elliptic modular function appears. And he knew this number 196883 from group theory. And when he started looking at complex function theory, he noticed this number 196884. So he had this rather remarkable theorem. It says 196884 is 196883 plus one. And he even had a t-shirt with his theorem written on it that he went round to at conferences. And he told several people about this and the general reaction of most people was this was complete nonsense. Um, the point is there are lots of sporadic groups, they have lots and lots of different um, dimensions of representations, there are lots of variations of modular functions which have lots of coefficients and if you have a whole lot of numbers then a few of them are going to be roughly the same as each other just by coincidence. So there's a whole area of crackpot nonsense called numerology where you find meaningless numerical coincidences by looking at lots and lots of numbers and noticing that some of them are about the same. So general reaction to most people was to dismiss this as meaningless. Um, however, I think it was John Thompson then noticed there were some other coincidences. For instance, if you take this coefficient of the elliptic modular function, it's the sum of the first three um, dimensions of representations of the monster. And John Thompson noticed that if you went on further, you got more and more coincidences. And by this time, it was clear that this wasn't a coincidence at all. Um, then John Conway and Simon Norton um, took this over and found more and more relations between the monster group and elliptic modular functions, as I'll describe in a moment. And John Conway um, coined this term monstrous moonshine um, for this. Um, so um, that's what this talk is going to be about. So um, next I'll talk very roughly about the construction of the monster. Um, so the monster, the existence was suggested in the 1980s by Fisher and Grice. And I think most people thought it was going to be hopeless to construct it since much, much, much smaller groups required computer constructions at that time. Um, people have since found hand constructions of most of them. And the trouble with the monster is that its smallest, the dimension of its smallest representation is so large that it was way beyond what computers at the time could cope with. Uh, even today, 30 years later, computers have a certain amount of trouble handling matrices of this size. Um, so much smaller groups took very difficult computer calculations. Robert Grice absolutely astonished everybody by managing to, to construct this, the monster by hand. So it was not only far bigger than all the um, groups people had constructed by computer, but he wasn't even using a computer. Um, the reason he was able to do this is um, this 19688 four-dimensional representation of the monster turns out to have a product on it. 
Um, it's actually quite unusual for small representations of sporadic groups to have algebra structures. So that in some sense, Robert Grice was really lucky. Um, so Robert Grice constructed this commutative product on uh, this space of dimension. Uh, I guess he was actually working the space of dimension 196883 rather than four. Um, and this, this product is commutative and doesn't seem to satisfy any other particularly easy identities. And Robert Grice's construction was ferociously difficult. What he did was he split up this 196883 dimensional representation into a sum of three pieces. So one piece has dimension a symmetric square of 24. Another has dimension half the number of norm four vectors of the Leech lattice. And the third has a sort of spinner representation tensor with the Leech lattice. Um, what, the reason he was able to do this is the centralized of an involution. The monster has this rather special structure. It's, it's got something called an extra special group here with Conway's sporadic simple group sitting on top of it. And these are all rep closely connotations of, of Conway's group. Um, so anyway, he had to construct an algebra product on it. And this is really complicated. For any two of these spaces, he had to construct a product going from those two spaces to the third space. So there are you know, about a um, dozen different products he had to write down. And then he had to make these all compatible so the monster would act on them. Then he had to find an non-obvious automorphism that generated the monster. And you know, his, his, his construction is about 100 pages long. Um, it's since been simplified considerably, but even today, it's, there's no really easy construction of the monster. Um, so the word moonshine originally means foolish talk or unrealistic ideas, um, which was partly why Conway chose the term, because the original idea of monstrous moonshine seemed silly. So a famous quote by Ernest Rutherford says that, you know, anyone who expects to get power from atom splitting is talking moonshine. Um, it also refers to corn whiskey, especially that produced illegally. So um, this, this does have a bit of a problem. If you try searching for moonshine on Google, what you get is a lot of recipes for distilling alcohol rather than um, talks about the monster. Um, so, um, so the monster is a rather large sporadic group. Um, so um, in order to understand it, we can start by looking at some much smaller groups. So this is the smallest non-abelian simple group is the group of symmetries of an icosahedron. And it's got 60 symmetries and 60 is a rather big number to handle. But fortunately, you can classify these symmetries into conjugacy classes. So for example, the icosahedron has five different conjugacy classes. You can fix everything, or you can take this axis here and do a one third rotation around it, or you can take this green line here as an axis and do a 180 degree rotation, or you can fix this red axis here and rotate the icosahedron by one fifth or two fifths of a rotation. So altogether, although there are 60 different elements of this group, you can classify them into five different conjugacy classes. So we're going to do something rather similar to that for the monster. So for the icosahedron, it has 60 symmetries, five conjugacy classes, and lives in three dimensions. So that's small enough to do everything by hand. The monster, by comparison, has about 8 times 10 to the 53 symmetries. So you cannot possibly store all these even on the biggest computer you can imagine. Fortunately, we don't need to because the number of conjugacy classes is astonishingly small compared to the size of the group. There are only 194 conjugacy classes. And that's a little bit too much to do by hand, but a computer has no trouble with these. Um, finally, it lives in 196883 dimensions as opposed to three dimensions. Um, well, 196883, obviously, you can't write down a matrix of that size by hand, but it does more or less fit onto a computer. If you've got a gigabyte or so of storage, then you can quite happily store um, 
one element of the monster as a matrix over the field with two elements. Um, so, um, when, when you're handling groups on a computer or by hand, you don't write down a multiplication table for any group with order more than about four or five because it's too ridiculously big. What you do is you write down something called its character table. So here's the character table of the group of order 60. Um, so on the top row, you list the conjugacy classes of the group. So we have five conjugacy classes of the group. Um, each of the other rows tells you something about an action of the group on a vector space. These are the so-called irreducible representations. So, so the group can act on various vector spaces, and you can sometimes split these vector spaces up into smaller vector spaces. And if you can't split it up further, that's called an irreducible representation. And um, this group of order 60 has exactly five irreducible representations. These numbers here are their dimensions. So you can see it lives in three dimensions, which is the obvious action on rotations of an icosahedron, and it also has a few others. The other entries are given by the traces of various conjugacy classes um, on these on these vector spaces. Um, obviously, the, the trace only depends on the conjugacy class. So instead of having to write out a 60 by 60 matrix, all you have to do is to write out a 5 by 5 matrix. It turns out this gives you most of the information you need about the group A5. Um, anyway, the, the monster is actually one of the spradic groups. I'll just give some quick background about this. Um, so the classification of finite groups was finished. Well, actually, it's not quite clear exactly when it was finished. It was announced that it was finished in 1983 by Gorenstein, but uh, he'd been slightly misinformed about um, one of the pieces that still hadn't been finished. That was finally finished off by um, Ashbacher and Smith in about 2004 or so. So anyway, the classification of finite simple groups, it's... It's so long, nobody actually knows how long it is. I've seen estimates of 10 or 20,000 pages, but um, this doesn't include some very long computer calculations that were needed to verify the existence of groups and so on. So, so nobody really knows exactly how long the classification is. Anyway, um, so the, 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 it says that all finite simple groups are either cyclic or alternating, which are the ones you come across as undergraduates, or their chevalet groups and various variations of them like Steinberg and regroups. A typical example of this are matrix groups over finite fields like general linear and orthogonal groups. And finally, there are 26 sporadic groups left over, of which the smallest is M11 with about 8,000 elements, and the largest is the monster, um, discovered and constructed by Fisher and Grice. Um, these are a real puzzle. Nobody has really come up with a good explanation for why we have these sporadic groups. Um, so all the other groups fit into neat infinite families. And these ones just seem to be left over. And not only do we not have any easy proof of why they exist, we don't have any simple explanation of why we get them. Um, so um, the character table of A5 looks like this. The character table of the monster is 196884 by 196884. And here is a piece of the top left-hand corner of it. Um, maybe if I try zooming in a bit, you might just about be able to see that this entry up here says 196883. Um, so um, the, this column here gives um, other spaces, dimensions of other spaces that it lives in, and these give traces of various elements of the monster on that space. This is, this is, this is about 3% of the monster character table on this slide. Um, if you want the full character table of the monster, you can find it written out in the Atlas of Finite Groups by 
Conway and um, his colleagues. Um, so that's enough about the monster simple group for the moment. Now I want to talk about elliptic modular functions for a bit. So the elliptic modular function can be defined as follows. Um, the special linear group in two variables over Z, which is SL2Z acts on H, the upper half plane of all numbers tau with positive imaginary part, um, as these fractional linear or Mobius transformations. Um, SL2Z is generated by these two particularly simple transformations. You can take tau to tau plus one or minus one over tau. And a modular function is just a function on the upper half plane, preferably holomorphic, that is invariant under this action of SL2Z. Um, so a modular function just satisfies uh, this equation here. There are no easy examples of modular functions. The simplest example is the so-called elliptic modular function. Um, turns out to, it's so-called because it classifies elliptic curves in some sense. You can actually write this as an invariant of an elliptic curve and two elliptic curves over the complex numbers are the same if and only if they have the same elliptic modular invariant. Um, there's no particularly easy way to construct it. The simplest way is to construct it as E4 cubed over delta, where E4 is the simplest Eisenstein series given by this series here. And delta is the this sort of interesting product here, whose coefficients look like this. So the, these coefficients are called the Ramanujan tau function, and the tau in the Ramanujan tau function has nothing to do with this tau here. Um, E4 and delta aren't quite modular functions. They're things called modular forms, which satisfy a slightly different form of um, identity. Instead of being invariant under SL2, they transform up to um, um, a power of C tau plus D. The reason they're called modular forms is that if this exponent here is a 2, then that's more or less the same as a one form that is invariant under SL2Z. So these are modular forms of weight 4 and 12, where the numbers 4 and 12 are this exponent here. So if you take one of weight 4 and cube it and divide it by one of weight 12, you get one of weight 0, which is, means it's just invariant under SL2Z. So that's roughly where the elliptic modular function comes from. Um, if you want to know what the action of SL2Z looks like on the upper half plane, um, well, Escher drew some rather nice pictures of it. Um, so um, this is a picture of, well, it's not quite SL2Z acting on the upper half plane. It's a slightly different group. And instead of upper half plane, it's acting on the circle is conformally equivalent to the upper half plane so the action of SL so the action of groups on the upper half plane sort of looks like this so all these angels and demons are really the same size because um, the metric on this is really a hyperbolic metric and you can't really embed this in Euclidean space very well if you if you embed it in Euclidean space then things get distorted so um, so this gives us a group there's a group which takes each angel to any other angel. And a modular function would be something like a function on this circle that is invariant if you transform any angel into any other angel. So here's a rather nice picture of the modular function um, from the book Janke and Emder, who I think this book is about 100 years old, and these they, they drew these absolutely amazing pictures of various complicated transcendental functions. And you must remember they were working long before computers were invented. These are not computer graphics. These were all carefully drawn by hand by some rather brilliant draftsman. So this is not quite the elliptic modular function I was talking about, but it is, in fact, a very similar function. So this is the upper half plane. Here we have the real axis. And 
off here, we're going off to infinity. And along the real axis, you can see the function gets very complicated. It's got all these poles. So it's got poles here at minus one and one. And it, roughly speaking, it has a pole at every rational number where, where the pole is bigger if the denominator of the rational number is smaller. Actually, these poles are all really the same size. Um, because they can be transformed into each other by elements of the modular group. They just sort of look different sizes because we've had to put them in Euclidean space. Um, the actual elliptic modular function looks a bit different because it has a pole at I infinity over here, whereas this modular function vanishes at I infinity. And here's another view of it where this time you're looking from I infinity and, and again the um, real axis is now this line here. Um, so, um, well, there are quite a lot of elliptic modular functions. Um, J of tau that we've been talking about is in some sense the simplest one. Um, first of all, we're using the group SL2 of Z, which is one of the simplest groups. There are lots of other groups you could use. You could take a finite a subgroup of SL2Z of finite index. Um, and it turns out that the elliptic modular function is actually an isomorphism from the upper half plane modulo SL2Z to the complex numbers. What this means is that any other elliptic modular function for SL2Z is actually a function of J of tau. So it really is the simplest opt to doing silly things like adding a constant or whatever. Um, it has some other rather astonishing properties. One rather famous one is that J of tau is an algebraic integer whenever tau is an imaginary quadratic irrational. Um, a particularly spectacular example of this is when you take the um, imaginary quadratic irrational to be 1 plus i root 1, 6, 3 over 2. I mean, in this case, it's not just an algebraic integer, but it's an actual integer given by this number here. Um, the reason why it's an exact integer is that J of tau is an algebraic integer of degree equal to the class number of a certain imaginary quadratic field. And the imaginary quadratic field generated by this number here happens to have class number one. It's the biggest um, imaginary quadratic field of class number one, as was shown by Hagner and Stark and Baker a few decades ago. Anyway, it's exactly this integer. And if you work out the elliptic modular function, it has this power series expansion. Well, this is um, some really large number because it's about e to the pi root 163. This is an integer. And this is a really tiny number because although 196884 is large, q is incredibly tiny because it's e to the minus something big. So, so this number here, e to the pi root 163, is very, very close to an integer. If you work it out, you find and there's this whole train lines as well. Um, there are various other, I mean, you can, you, you can stick in various other numbers other than 163, and quite often, well, not very often, but occasionally it turns out to be very nearly an integer. Um, incidentally, you notice 743.999 is very close to 744, which is the 744 here. And that's not a coincidence because this number here is divisible by lots of small primes. And in particular, it's divisible by a thousand. So you can actually see the constant coefficient of the elliptic modular function in this large integer here. So um, the moonshine conjectures um, by Mackay and Thompson stated that there should be a natural graded representation of the monster um, um, such that the dimension of these, the pieces of the representation should be given by coefficients of the elliptic modular function. Um, now, but at the time, this was an um, examples of finite groups acting on graded representations related to modular functions. So, so this was a um, really astonishing conjecture. And well, of course, you could do this in a stupid way. You would just take a trivial representation of this dimension or something like that. So to give the conjecture teeth, you've got to say more about this representation. 
And John Thompson suggested that what you should do is look at the so-called Mackay-Thompson series, where you take the trace of an element of the monster on this graded representation and see what sort of function it is. And Conrad Norton worked this um, what they did was they guessed what these representations of the monster were and were able to work out these traces from the character table of the monster and found the astonishing fact that these functions here see, were helped modules, or at least seem to be, for all um, conjugacy classes of the monster. So a helped module is an isomorphism from the upper half plane modulo sum group to the complex numbers for some subgroup of SL2R. Now, if you take a random subgroup, usually there won't be an isomorphism from this quotient to C because this thing will be a Riemann surface of genus greater than zero. So, so what Conway Norton discovered is all these functions are associated to quotients that have genus zero rather than some higher genus. So the question is, can you construct such a representation? Um, Anyway, so um, I said that Thompson suggested that the trace of um, any element of the monster on a on this grade representation should be a hat module for some other group. So here are a couple of examples for type two a and two b. The first few coefficients um, look like this. So for example, here we get four three seven two as the coefficient of the Haupt module for this group here, which is the normalizer of gamma zero of two, where gamma zero of two is given like that. And this turns out to be almost the dimension of a representation of a baby monster. And it's also the trace of an element of type 2a of the monster on 196.884. So, so the, these astonishing coincidences keep on going. Um, by the way, the, uh, an earlier observation about the monster was due to Og, who noticed that a prime divided the order of the monster if and only if the normalizer of gamma zero of P was a genus zero group. Um, well, Conway and Norton's conjecture about the monster was proved um, by Atkin, Fong, and Smith. Um, and what they did was they did a big calculation. What you can do is you can show that something is a representation of a group just by checking um, a lot of congruences. Um, so since the representations are given by coefficients and modular functions, what you have to do is to check enough congruences between coefficients and modular function, um, and then you can show that things are representation. Well, strictly speaking, you only show their virtual representations. You also have to check some positivity condition, which is not too difficult because the coefficients of the elliptic modular function are so huge that it's not that hard to show things are positive. So that sort of verifies the original Conway Norton conjectures, but it leaves you a bit unsatisfied because it doesn't really explain what's going on. It's just a sort of verification. Um, and in particular, it doesn't really give you a very satisfying construction of the representation of the monster. It just sort of says this representation exists because we've checked all these congruences. So Frenkel, Lepaski, and Merman managed to actually construct an explicit graded representation of the monster using vertex operators. And they were able to show that this graded representation has the right degrees. And, um, um, and this leaves a bit of a puzzle because we now have two graded representations of the monster. We have one whose existence was shown by Atkin, Fong, and Smith by checking a lot of congruences. And we have another graded representation of the monster constructed by Frenkel, Lepowski, and Merman, um, which we have an explicit construction of. However, the problem is we don't know these two representations are the same. Um, so this representation is nice because you can do things like construct algebra products on it. And this representation is nice because it's related to modular functions. And you'd really, really like to know that these two representations are the same. So the problem is the, the, the 
The problem of proving the monstrous moonshine conjecture is, is, is to verify these two representations are the same. In other words, what you want to do is to construct the, sorry, can calculate the trace of elements of the monster on this representation here. Um, this turns out to be easy enough to do for some elements if they commute with a certain element of order two, but the, the, the construction of this representation is so complicated, it seems almost impossible to calculate the traces of other elements of the monster directly. Um, so calculating the trace of elements has to be done indirectly. Um, first of all, um, the advantage of the frenkel lepowski merman representation over the one constructed by Atkin, Fong and Smith is you can find an algebraic structure on it. It's something called a vertex algebra. Um, more precisely, it's something called the monster vertex algebra because it's acted on by the monster. Um, now, the, to verify that it's the same as the Atkin, Fong, Smith representation takes a few steps. First of all, you use string theory in 26 dimensions and something called the no-ghost theorem in string theory in order to construct a Lie algebra called the monster Lie algebra that I'll talk about a bit later. This is an example of something called a generalized Katz-Moody algebra, um, which I'll, again, I'll describe a bit later. The next step is to use something called the via Katz denominator formula order to extract information about the um, traces of elements of the monster on the frenkel lepowski merman formula. In particular, they have a property called complete replicability, which was um, originally defined by Simon Norton. Finally, you can show that any function that is completely replicable is a Haupt module. Um, the proof of this was a very messy and ugly calculation, but fortunately Martin and Cummins and Gannon managed to um, greatly simplify this and were able to find um, a more conceptual proof that completely replicable functions are Haupt modules. So finally, we find the trace of any element of the monster on the frenkel lepowski merman module is indeed a Haupt module. So now I'll talk about a bit more about vertex algebras and so on. And so the question is, what is a vertex algebra? Unfortunately, there is no easy answer to this question. Um, <clears throat> the problem is that it is basically a provable theorem that there are no particularly easy non-trivial examples of vertex algebras to study. Um, probably the least worst introduction to vertex algebras is the book Vertex Algebras for Beginners by Victor Katz. Um, the title of this book is a bit of a joke. It's not really for beginners at all, but anyway. Um, so here is a vague idea of what a vertex algebra is. Um, it's a sort of commutative ring, except it isn't. Um, so let's suppose we've got a commutative ring acted on by a group. Then we can form expressions like u to the x times v to the y, where u and v are in the ring and x and y are in the group, and u to the x is the action of x on the group u. And if we fix two elements of the group, this gives a map from the ring. Um, from, sorry, if we fix two elements of the ring, this gives a map from the group times the group to the ring. And a vertex algebra is similar, except that the maps from the, from the group times the group to the ring sort of have singularities as functions of x and y. In particular, they might not be defined when x and y are the identity element of the group. And this is a real problem, because in order to define the ring multiplication, you need to define this when x and y are the um, elements are the trivial elements of the group. So it's sort of like a ring, except the ring multiplication isn't defined in some rather weird sense. Um, instead of the ring multiplication, all you've got are these, you might think of them as being rational functions on the group, which behave as if they were um, given by this formula here, um, except instead of being a regular function of x and y, it's some sort of strange function with singularities. 
Um, so there's an easy way to construct lots of vertex algebras. You can just take any commutative ring acted on by a group, and this will give you a vertex algebra. These are the trivial vertex algebras. Um, they're just commutative rings with groups acting on them. The more general vertex algebras have strange singularities all over the place as functions of group. And there are no finite dimensional examples of them. The point is that once you've got a singularity like a pole of order one, then you can automatically generate singularities of higher and higher order. So you can get poles of order two, three, and four. And so you can get poles of any possible order. And this means you've got infinite dimensional spaces. And so there are no, so any finite dimensional vertex algebra is automatically just a commutative ring with a group acting on it. Um, next, we move on to generalized Katz-Moody algebras, which, as the name suggests, are rather like Katz-Moody algebras, only more so. Um, so as motivation for generalized Katz-Moody algebras, consider a finite dimensional reductive Lie algebra, for instance, just the Lie algebra of n by n matrices. And we're going to be working over the real numbers. And it has the following four um, properties, all of which are very easy to check for the n by n matrices. First of all, it's got a nice invariant bilinear form, which in this case is given by the trace. Secondly, it's got an involution. You can just take the transpose or rather minus the transpose or something. Thirdly, it's graded. And there are lots of ways of grading it. Um, for instance, for n by n matrices, you can just grade things by their distance from the diagonal. And rather obviously, all these graded pieces are finite dimensional because the Lie algebra is finite dimensional. Um, the involution is acts as minus one on the zero piece of degree zero. That's sort of important. Finally, this bilinear form isn't positive definite, but it becomes positive definite if you twiddle it by this involution. So it's, it's a sort of slightly twisted um, bilinear form with the positive definite property. So um, for a generalized Katz-Moody algebra, all you do is you very slightly weaken these conditions here. You allow the, the Lie algebra to be infinite dimensional, but it still had to satisfy all these conditions except for n equals zero. So you allow this bilinear form to be indefinite on the degree zero piece. If you insist that it should be positive definite from the degree zero piece, then you get the finite dimensional algebras and you also get the affine Katz-Moody algebras, um, which uh, are very widely used. Um, the, the basic theme of generalized Katz-Moody algebras is they have many of the good properties of finite dimensional simple Lie algebras. Um, for example, or suppose we take SL2 with coefficients that are Laurent series. This is the simplest non-trivial example of an affine Katz-Moody algebra. Now, finite dimensional Lie algebras have a vile Katz denominator formula. Um, the vile Katz denominator formula for finite dimensional affine, sorry, for infinite dimensional affine Lie algebras turn out to be well-known identities. For instance, the Varkatz denominator form of SL2 is this formula here, which is the Toby triple product identity. Um, there's a sort of um, historical remark about the McDonald identities that I want to make. Um, there's a famous paper by Dyson called Missed Opportunities in Science, where he describes where he was looking at identities for powers of eta functions. So the cube of the eta function is a very nice classical identity due to Jacobi, I think. And Dyson said that he found similar identities for various powers of the eta function. So 3, 8, 10, 14, 15, 21, and so on. And he was very puzzled by this couldn't figure out what was going on. It turned out that this had already been explained by Ian MacDonald, 
who pointed out they were just dimensions of representations of Lie groups. So for each power, each dimension of Lie group, Ian MacDonald found an identity for the corresponding power of the eta function. These are the famous MacDonald identities. Um, and um, MacDonald actually showed that these were essentially the denominator formula for algebra is Katz Moody algebra it's quite been invented at the time. They were invented very shortly afterwards by Katz and Moody, who pointed out that McDonald's identities were just the Katz file um, formula, denominator formula for these algebras. Um, so what we're going to, however, um, the monster Lee algebra is also a generalized Katz Moody algebra. So it has a denominator formula, and the denominator formula is this rather striking identity for the um, elliptic modular function. Um, the, um, who discovered this identity is a bit difficult to sort out because none of the people who discovered it seem to have published it. So Simon Norton and Don Zagius seem to have known about it in the 1980s, and Koiki sort of had a proof of it that circulated in a preprint that was never published either, again, sometime in the 1980s. So, I don't know, one of these three may have been the first to discover it, but it's, it's difficult to sort out exactly who did it when, because as far as I know, none of them ever published it for some reason. Um, anyway, um, so if we compare the coefficients of p to the n, q to the b in both sides, we obtain lots of relations between the coefficients. Um, these relations are quite complicated. For instance, the simplest relation for the elliptic modular function is the following relation between the coefficients of q to the 4, q to the 3, and q to the 1. You see this number is equal to that number plus the sort of alternating square of this number. So these identities are really quite complicated. And Norton defined a function to be completely replicable if it satisfied identities coming from this infinite product. Actually, Norton didn't state it in terms of the infinite product, but in terms of some rather complicated recursion relations. Um, and Norton and Koiki didn't actually write this identity as infinite product. They, they, they both just worked with the rather complicated relations you get by expanding out this infinite product. Um, anyway, you notice this infinite product um, looks just like the via denominator formula. So the via denominator formula says an infinite product over positive roots of a Lie algebra is equal to sum over the via group. So for the monster Lie algebra, the via group is order two, and this is a sum over its via group. And this is just a product over the positive roots of the monster Lie algebra. Um, um, Simon Norton also had some generalizations of the moonshine conjecture called the generalized moonshine conjectures. So, um, so the original moonshine conjectures gave um, a representation of the monster. Simon Norton pointed out that for each element of the monster, there seems to be a projective representation of its centralizer in the monster on um, some other space here. So instead of having a modular function for each element of the monster, Simon Norton suggests there should be a modular function for each pair of elements of the monster, and these should give projective representations of centralizers of elements in the monster. And they should satisfy some identities like this. And this is rather nice because the group SL2Z acts on pairs of commuting elements of a group. So the group SLT T is acting not only on modular function, but on pairs of commuting elements. And Simon suggests that these should also be help modules. Um, at the time I originally gave this talk, these conjectures were unproved, although some cases of this had been done. The first breakthrough was made by G Gerald Hearn, who managed to prove the conjectures for type 2a in the monster by um, a very ingenious way of constructing a representation 
of the baby monster. Um, Dong and Mason were able to prove it for whenever GNH generated a cyclic group. And Dong was able to prove two of the conjectures whenever um, for all G and H. Finally, the full conjectures were proved by Carnahan a few years ago um, by extending the construction of the monster Lie algebra to construct a large number of other somewhat more complicated Lie algebras. Um, an example of the generalized moonshine conjectures is um, if you take the trace of an element of type 2a on the monster, its coefficients look like this. On the other hand, if you take the baby monster, it's the centralized of an element of type 2a, or at least its double cover is, and it is this order, so it's pretty huge, not nearly as big as the monster, but still rather formidable, and it has representations of these dimensions here. And if you look at these dimensions, you said they're very similar to these coefficients of this modular function. And it turns out the double cover of the baby monster acts on a graded vector space with these dimensions. So the trace of an element of type 2a on the monster gives you a function which is the same as the function given by the dimensions of the representations of an element of type 2b. So there's, there's this funny connection between the representation of the monster and the representation of the baby monster. Incidentally, you might guess that this representation of the baby monster also has the algebraic structure of, the, of a vertex algebra. However, it doesn't. Um, in particular, there's no nice product from v2 times v2 to itself, as you would need if this was the well, um, Alex Reber observed that, um, so I said that you don't get a vertex algebra corresponding to the baby monster. Well, in fact, you do. Alex Reber noticed that you don't get a vertex algebra in characteristic zero, but if you reduce mod p, then you sometimes do. So if we take... Um, an element of prime order of the monster, um, then um, we can take the cohomology group of um, that element on the monster, and it turns out that this cohomology actually forms a graded vertex superalgebra. Um, so for some elements of the monster, these give you vertex algebras over finite fields, and for other elements, they give you super algebras of finite fields. So we have this strange phenomenon that um, characteristic zero representations of the monster give you vertex algebras, and if you take cohomology, this gives you vertex algebras over finite fields that cannot be lifted to vertex algebras in characteristic zero. Um, I'll finish by describing two open problems. It says three open problems here, but that's because these slides are out of date and one of these open problems was, has actually been more or less solved. So Hitzebrook had this question, is there a 24 dimensional monster manifold with Witten genus given by the elliptic modular function? If so, this might give another explanation of the monster vertex algebra. There's been some progress on this by Hopkins and Maharwald, who managed to show there was indeed a manifold with this as its Witten genus, but last time I checked, um, nobody knows how to construct an action of the monster on this manifold. Um, Lian and Yao pointed out that there are mirror maps for K3 surfaces that seem to be related to monstrous Hout modules. One example of this is there's a mirror map um, given by the inverse of the elliptic modular function. So whether that is related to the monster seems to be open. The third problem, which is uh, has actually been solved, is this weird observation by John Mackay. He pointed out the monster has nine conjugacy classes of elements of the form GH, where G and H are products of 
uh, elements of type 2a. And their orders are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 4, 2. And these are exactly the numbers you get on weights of the affine E8 Dinkin diagram. And they're also the dimensions of the irreducible representations of the binary icosahedral group, which is a double cover of the simple group of order 60. Um, well, this it's not quite clear if this is a coincidence or not, but then you notice the baby monster and the Fisher group, which is a um, more or less a centralizer of an element of order three in the monster have similar properties except these are related to the e7 and the e6 um dinkin diagrams or possibly the f4 and g2 dinkin diagrams it's a bit hard to tell because f4 is a sort of folded version of e7 and g2 is a sort of folded version of e6 so um in this case um the baby monster is a three four transposition group which means that the product of two involutions can of order one two three four or two and the fisher group is a three transposition group which means the product of two involutions is orders one two or three and these correspond to representations of the binary octahedral and the binary tetrahedral groups and these observations were sort of more or less explained in terms of subalgebras of the vertex algebra of these groups by Hearn, Lam, Yamada, and Yamauchi. Finally, after this original talk was given, there's been some very interesting new ideas about um, umbral moonshine relating representations of M24 and Niemeyer lattices to various mock theta functions. And I think that's a good topic for another talk. <laughs>